Welcome to yet another episode of St. Toga Interviews. So my guest is returning, is John Whitberg, and this time we want to focus on just one of his altars, his Adam altar, who served a 50 and back for Solar Warden. And the idea is to dig into the history of the American SSPs and their colonies throughout the solar system and as well as getting to the large assortment of ET races that he's encountered. So my first question for you is, does your disclosure information come from first-hand experience or do you also source it from other places like the internet? If I'm sourcing it, I'll always qualify that I heard this somewhere or I read this somewhere. Uh, if I state something is a fact, it's because I remember it. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's what I thought, but I wanted to, yeah. um, to make sure. And would you say that SSP research uh, is is a good idea for triggering uh, recall, or what do you find works best in your case? Yeah, it does. Um, there's some stuff that if I hadn't heard certain testimonies, I would have never figured out. And uh, I know some people prefer not to, and that's totally up to them. That's fine. I don't, uh, if they don't want to have any influence on their testimony, but I needed the assistance personally. So, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, that makes sense. It's not the same for everyone. And you also stated that the author that we'll discuss actually forced his reintegration on you back in July 2019 after sir finishing his duty, which he started in 1969. And how did he find out that he was an altar? And how did he actually manage to do this merger? I don't think he actually realized he was an altar because to this day he refuses to admit that I exist. I think what happened is the soul fragment rehomed and neither of us actually knew what was happening. So he wound up just being there. And yeah, it was a really messy time in my life. But neither of us was exactly aware of what was happening. Yes. So he might have just done it because of necessity and it might not even have been deliberate at all. It might have been his only option at the time. Yeah. I doubt it was his only option because I do have other altars that are active at the moment. But I'm probably the one who's in the most stable life right now. So... Probably I would be the easiest for him to adapt to. Right, if... right. And um, do you, can you actually uh, befriend an altar? Because I think you said something along these lines and that um, it actually is a way for you to even retrieve memories maybe? Yes, I. you can befriend one if you reach out telepathically. Well, sometimes they won't acknowledge that you exist, like Adam still hasn't really. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you can befriend them. And the one that I've befriended, he had a lot of questions for me. He had just as many, if not more, for me than I did for him, uh, which is natural. Uh, and so one thing I've discovered that has worked is projecting images into his head and he'll project images of memories into my head. So that's so, how. So it's not in English, it's, it's visual more so? Oh, we do have conversations sometimes, but actual memories is that we swap are visual. Right, and the so the one that forced his way into your mind and that triggered the big flood, um, doesn't necessarily know that you exist. Is that, is that true? He knows I exist. He doesn't want to admit it. He's very arrogant. He doesn't like to admit that there are other aspects of him uh, in existence. 
it's very hard to put into words to someone who's not <laughs> experiencing it, but that's the gist of it, basically. And do they share memory once you are somewhat uh, reintegrated like you are with Adam? Uh, from that moment on, are you no longer compartmentalized or how does it work? I believe it depends on the faction and how good their tech, their mind wiping tech is. Okay. Adam, I have a lot of memories from, not full memories by any means, but a huge chunk because that's basically how Solar Warden tech is. And like I've met other people who were in Solar Warden who also have higher amounts of memories from that faction than from other ones. So I think that they have less good tech. But do you reckon that you you will get on better and better terms with Adam and with Syme? Do you think you can improve your relationship? And also, uh, what is it that he's triggered by? What's his pattern of um, emerging? Well, honestly, I'm being very nice to him. It's up to him if he wants to start getting along with me. He emerges typically either when I'm angry or when I'm aroused. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's his pattern. He doesn't always emerge at those times, and there are times, there are other times that he emerges just randomly. Uh, and I suppress his personality because he's, I don't blame him considering the circumstances of his coming to exist for being this way, but he's very manipulative and arrogant and an alcoholic, so. Right. Yeah, we'll get into how he acquired that alcohol yeah. a little later, but so also um, I, I need to ask this that would you if you were able reintegrate all your alters just uh, overnight or would you prefer it this way gradually so as to not overburden your psyche i would prefer to do it slower uh partly to not overburden myself partly because most of them aren't really great people and i i don't want to lose control and also because Sometimes reintegrating means killing the other altar. Not always, but sometimes. And they they have their own lives. They have their own things going on. A couple of them have their own families. So I wouldn't appreciate if they stripped me from my life just overnight. So I wouldn't want to do that to them. So you would be content with no longer having any connection with them? No, I want connection uh, because I feel like I have a right to know, but I don't feel like it's necessary to take over for them or to let them take over for me. And when you say that you can actually cause their death when, when you integrate, does that mean that they would become aware of the slavery that they're subjected to and that's what would lead them to uh, rebelling out there? Or what do you mean by death? I mean, like, it might, it, there are times where when you uh, reintegrate, the soul fragment will rehome, it will leave that body entirely. So that would mean definitely death because your body needs at least a fragment of a soul to animate. But isn't it also true that, at least as far as clothes go, they, they already have a soul, it's just uh, being suppressed. So wouldn't yes. that take over? Yes, that's true too. But it to me, it's still morally questionable because, again, they do have their own lives. Um, so, yeah. No, no, yeah. I get it. And so let's let's switch over to the solar warden end of things. So do they rely mainly on clones from Earth uh, as personnel? I believe so, yes. 
or clones from they do get clones from uh humans on other planets too but which you have seen yes yeah and meaning that are part of the breakaways or yes right and how many have been born because i hear that they do multiply and stuff uh in their bases or in their ships versus how many are kidnapped from earth or other colonies i'd say 90 percent are kidnapped maybe 10 percent were born out there the 90 percent are human trafficking victims or if they're a different species then they're whatever species trafficking victims but i'm guessing it's on an upswing this percentage of 10 percent right because they would have only been able to to bolster their numbers by reproduction in more recent years so maybe they're aiming towards that do you think yeah i think so not for good right. reasons by the way they don't it's not because they have an objection to slavery or anything, but it is cheaper and easier to have people be born into your society. Right. So it's just a matter of establishing enough of uh, genetic diversity to begin with, I guess. But also, have any of them been there willingly, or do most of the people you interact with have been taken against their will? Nearly all of them have been taken against their will. The only people who I would say might have had a choice in the matter were some of the very top brass and uh, a few civilian contractors. But Because that's a different thing from enlisted military. Uh, but Or people that have a gift, that are especially gifted that they can't deny and they can make up for it like I, I know for example Daryl's one of them yeah that's possible there I'm sure there are a few people like that but not many right yeah and do they have a criteria for who they pick and do they do it from all over I, I guess not just America yeah they do it from all over um, I remember Swedish people, there were some Koreans, there were some people who, uh, they might, they were a different Asian ethnicity, Southeast Asian, I don't know, maybe Filipino, Cambodian, Thai, something like that. Black people? Oh uh, Yeah, there were black people with the Americans, uh, yeah. What about black from Africa or black from America, do you know? I... Uh, I never saw any people from Africa in Solar Warden. I did in, interestingly enough, I did see a few in Dark Fleet, but um, not in Solar Warden. I did see black Americans and black Canadians in Solar Warden, though. Right. And also, the what's their requirements uh, in terms of lineage and such? Have you noticed any patterns there? Uh, basically the same as the other groups. Um, ethnicities who have higher psi abilities and ethnicities which have uh, more ET DNA, which that includes like Germans, Scandinavians, uh, some East Asians, some Native American tribes, descendants, I believe, from a couple of African tribes. Uh, which all come down to their ET, you know, forefathers. Yeah. And at the same time, it's worth mentioning that Solar Warden was not responsible for your hybridization in utero. No, that was the CIA. And if you come from somewhere other than the US, it's whatever the main intelligence agency is in that country. I see. And this is something that we often hear about that the main function that Solar Warden try to accomplish is the border security for the solar system. And does that imply that they are confined to the solar system? Mm, no, it doesn't. It. I have memories of them setting up colonies on a couple of habitable rogue planets that were just past the Oort cloud. 
and I know people who've encountered them as far away as the Pleiades. Uh, so, no. But their main... Their big thing is policing the solar system. And that goes beyond just uh, human objectives. Uh, they, they also interfere in non-human conflicts, just as long as they are within the solar system. Yes. Uh, they... They're in an ongoing conflict with the Aldebarons, who are a massive threat to the solar system. Uh, they're at war with a couple of AI civilizations that are trying to invade the solar system and uh, a few other groups. So, so there's more than one, one major AI threat? I believe so, yes. But you weren't that much involved in the, in the combat? No, I wasn't. And what's the ratio of ETs to humans in, inside the Solar Warden's workforce? 80 to 85 percent human, and then 15 to 20, or I mean, yeah, 15 yeah. to 20 ET. I leave room because, of course, there are some ET species who you wouldn't be able to tell the difference unless either they told you or you did a DNA test. Right, right. And um, how would you describe their overall mission statement or their vision? And what would you say is their actual real motivation? Basically, what I've been able to piece together is that they're the military police of the so-called cabal or Illuminati or... Military industrial complex. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. That's basically their function. Uh, they're protecting Earth and the solar system because that's where the interests of that group lies. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts because they particularly care about humanity or about any planets. But as a byproduct of that being their main goal, we do get heavy protection. So, And they also managed to get a lot done to climb the ranks really quickly, considering how new they are in space, not a country time travel. But how would you explain their high position in the solar system? Um, is it just that no one else was up to the task and they needed someone doing the dirty work and that humans are inclined towards warring and are well suited for it? Did they just fill the gap there? Yes, I believe that's part of it. Although there have been people policing the solar system for millions of years. So, I mean, I think Solar Warden just happens to be the newest iteration of that. They just they took over for whoever was doing it before us. Um, and but who, you don't know who that is? No, I don't. I would, educated guess, I would say probably the tall whites, seeing as how they're at the head of Solar Warden, but that's an educated guess. That's not a for sure fact. And in addition to technology, their other big goal is to maintain the seat for Earth at the galactic table, and what do they benefit exactly from this? Uh, basically, they it ensures protection, and also it allows them to get better technology. Um, and do you have and a theory as to, as to the group that they are trying to be on the good side of? Like, is it the one that's... Uh, in a bubble around Saturn? I think it's that group. Um, I've never been to their area. I have seen their uh, some of their representatives of various races, and they, they do wear white uniforms and all that, like people have described. So I believe it's that group. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It must be. Uh, it goes by different names, so no use repeating those here. But... Going back to the tall whites, what would you say is the dynamic between them, between Solar Warden and them? Are they the 
that honcho or or are they just another ET species? Yeah, they're the head of Solar Warden and I believe most of the US Navy uh, is headed by the Tall Whites. There is another faction who is of the Navy that's basically the American Dark Fleet and they're Draco aligned, but that's a whole other story. But um, yeah, the Tall Whites are the head of Solar Warden. They say what goes and what doesn't go, who they're allowed to deal with, where they go, all that. I see. And just to make a um, comparison, because the biggest source provider of information for about Tall Whites is Charles Hall, who I'm sure you know of, and he describes them as being albino and uh, growing profusely past a certain age and becoming really frail in the process. Also, that they're very skinny, that they could just about pass over humans, but uh, also that they have very pronounced psionics and that their noses are smaller, but other than that, still quite related to us. Would you say they're the same as this? And what what can you share about their their physical appearance and maybe their temperament and character? I would say it's the same group that Charles Hall described. Um, temperament and character uh, is, they're very arrogant. They think that the galaxy is their playground, basically. And they're not the only people who think that, so they are in competition. And um, other than being really arrogant, they're decent enough as people. Uh, I mean, they look down on you, but they don't think of humans as pests. They think of us as useful. So they treat us okay. Uh, so so more, you, you've yeah. had extensive interactions with them. Yes, I was one of the people who would do liaison work with them. Uh, so, yeah. And their advanced psionics, would you say that they are innate or assisted by technology? Innate, I believe. Um, or they, they could, in theory, some of them be technologically assisted, but I think that the ones who are like in their military and stuff are specially selected because they're gifted. Um, and so. do they run circles around uh, humans in terms of telepathy and psi abilities? Average humans, yes. Uh, enhanced and trained humans are about on their level. So, so you didn't feel outpowered? Not really, not unless there was like a big group of them. But one on one, we were pretty evenly matched psionically. Cool. Right. And how much have the Solar Warden expanded? Um, and what's the type of the location that they most like? And how much further do they want, or are they happy with where they're at right now? Oh, they're continuing to expand, um, just like pretty much everyone. Like I said earlier, I know people who've encountered them as far away as the Pleiades, at least. Um, I personally only am aware of a few planets just outside the Oort cloud, rogue planets that they've colonized, but uh, I don't know everything. So that's entirely possible. And what was the other part of that question? What, what do they prefer in terms of location? Oh, they like, they tend to prefer for colonies, not so much for military bases, but for civilian colonies, they really prefer actually to build space stations because they're movable and they like to be near wormholes. Uh, so like something happens and they need to get the fuck out of Dodge, they want to be able to. So so would you say they have more population that is floating in space rather than uh, is uh, anchored on a planet? I would say so, yeah. And is it also applicable to the 
celestial bodies that they inhabit that the the main attraction for them is being near a wormhole yes right and so your memories with this altar go no further than 2019 but have any other of your altars seen a glimpse as to whether they were successful in their desire to expand further i have a memory from the 2030s that's in some it's in one of the stars in the Taurus constellation. I couldn't tell you which one, but I know I was with a Navy group. I don't know if that was Solar Warden or if it was the American Dark Fleet, which is also a Navy group. So could go either way. So they did manage in that timeline to fulfill their wishes there, right? To achieve more power. Yes. But it's not a given that we are on track to to meet that timeline as well, right? Because it's it's more fluid when you're going in the future than in the past. Uh, yeah, very much so. Like the timeline itself is sentient, and you can only change it so much because the timeline. If things are happening, it's usually because the timeline actively wants them to. So some things, it's going to fight back and make sure that some things happen no matter what. But a lot of little things you can change. Uh, And also, this is so hard to put into words, but the timeline is also aware of itself through the entirety of its existence. So it's possible that the timeline will manipulate things in the past or present to make sure that things in the future happen because it is like i said it's aware of its entire existence so it knows what is happening in the future i i know that that's that's an exclusive (laughs) yeah it's it's a head fuck but that's basically how it works (laughs) one very easy to understand i mean baby talk level the analogy that i've heard is from whitley streber who who got told from his et like friends that the past is like ice and the present is a converter and the the future is fluid or water and you can't enter the ice because it's already set but you can go inside the bubbles that are left there and fill them up as you wish so in other words after a certain point, you run out of bubbles, and that's what happened with Solar Warden and the other factions, right? That they have already pretty much run out of uh, the ability to to go back and exploit the past. Yeah, although, to continue the ice analogy, if you have good enough equipment, you can forcibly drill into ice, or you can melt ice, like, if you have equipment. And of course, but of course, it'll be fighting you, so you have to figure out whether it's worth it. If yeah, that, yeah. yeah, it does. And let's uh, segue into the historical part of because I think you can provide some insight there that you learned of how the American factions first uh, got established their first impetus, and it had to do with the two treaty that they they felt was unfair am i right yes they felt that they were humiliated and being forced to capitulate to the nazis so they basically redeclared world war ii Uh, so that's when they really began this rivalry in in a big way yes there were some inroads of it going back to like the World War One era of the SSP, but they became actively opposed during and after World War Two. And what about Dark Fleet? Were they just uh, watching this happen? Did they not try to stop it? Because they, I would assume that they saw this as a treason and they would have wanted to interfere before it got out of hand. They didn't really have much of a problem with it because most of the American military has been taken over by the German Nazi Dark Fleet, whatever you want to call it, group. Um, 
the CIA, the Air Force, the Army, whatever. The Navy is the one who kind of got away from that and then went into space and redeclared World War II. Um, that's basically how that went down. Right, and can you briefly go over the actual turning point that transformed what was just a small project into the behemoth that it is today, Solar Warden, I mean? Yes, this was the early 80s, uh, Reagan administration. The Secretary of the Navy at the time, John Lehman, uh, I sent you his Wikipedia. Uh, you Maybe you could leave it in the description of this video so people can check him out. But he was briefed on all of this. And he was like, how are we supposed to be fighting World War II in space if we, if our only group out there is a side project? And that side project, by the way, was called Project Mayflower. It began, I believe, in pretty much immediately after the treaty was signed with the Germans in the early or mid-50s. And then in 1982, I believe is when Solar Warden was established and our funding increased. Uh, this John Lehman guy, he started arguing both with the president and with the tall whites to allow us to get better technology, to start making deals with races and all that. Right, that makes sense. And did the real estate that they had acquired for the colonies back in the turn of the 20th century, before their conflict, the German Americans, did that come in handy for Solar Warden, and or was it just the American factions? Yeah, that came in handy for Solar Warden. Um, there were, I believe, the Europa base, which is where I was mostly working out of, was from around the turn of the century. Uh, you can tell usually by architecture, the newer stuff that they built after they started getting funding is much more modern and it's built in like easily movable, like modular buildings that can be disassembled and moved at a moment's notice if they need to. Their older stuff is clearly like permanent colonies that were established here and there. So you have Solar Warden outposts right now that have been built as far back as 1800s? Yes, they weren't Solar Warden at the time. Of but, course. Yeah. And can you address the split that later took place in Solar Warden uh, back in the early 90s? And what was the reason behind it? I think it was just the, the Solar Warden was getting too big too fast. So it split into two groups. It became Radiant Glory, which patrols the sun through the asteroid belt to the outer edge of the asteroid belt, and then Radiant Guardian, which is who I worked for, who patrolled from Jupiter to uh, the Oort cloud. And then there's a fellow whistleblower has said that the Oort Cloud and just past it is patrolled by a Japanese military faction uh, that is aligned with Solar Warden, but they're not the same thing. And this is another thing that I've heard from one other whistleblower that has served with Solar Warden that apparently Earth Defense Force has merged, has joined forces with Solar Warden. They've become a uh, unit and do you have you heard anything about this merged and um joined forces are two very different things them joining forces i can see over um a common enemy merging i if this person is saying they actually became one group i'm sorry to say but i think that person is full of shit uh because <laughs> Okay, the various defense forces 
or Dark Fleet. Earth Defense Force, Jupiter Defense Force, Mars Defense Force, Venus Defense Force, and so on. Those are Dark Fleet subsidiaries. So... They would go against the philosophy. Yeah. And the headquarters of the Solar Warden, is, is it true that it's on Mars? And what, was that the first maybe? Or what is its significance? It was definitely pretty old. It's in, um, I believe it was established in the 1930s. So during the pre-World War II period still. But yeah, it is pretty old. Um, and it, it it's in the Victoria Crater on Mars, which people can look that up. That's a place that people know about. There's pictures of it, blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, it's significant just because they say it is, basically. Um, Have you they, been? Yes, many times, many times. And is it overground or underground? Both. Some of it is down in the crater itself, and it's... Well, there is a dome over the whole thing, so... None of it is completely open to the outside, except maybe for, like, a couple of hangar bays. But uh, there's stuff... The living quarters are in the walls of the crater. So there's windows in it looking down. There's some buildings down in the crater, but most of the important stuff is underground. I think. So let's get back to the altar. You you were sent back in time, and that's not actually what I usually hear. It's usually from the present onward. So what do you think, what do you make of that? What's your theory as to their reasoning? That's an excellent question that I have been recently trying to figure out. Maybe it was that I was meant to have some sort of influence on the timeline. That's the only thing I can think of, but I know other people who have been sent back in time uh, for stuff. Like, I I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I believe Joseph has mentioned being sent back to the 50s, and one of his altars started working there up to the present. When he sees this, I'm sure if I'm wrong, he'll correct me, but yeah. I can only assume that it has to do with your like frequency or you know your heritage of the soul because uh, only certain people are able to do it and you were also sent this way in other factions. Am I correct? Yes, Dark Fleet does that to me all the time. Um, they send me back and forward throughout the timeline uh, all the time, like. I have memories from, I mentioned this briefly on my last interview, but I have a memory from Dark Fleet that I believe happened during, like, the Roman Empire. So, so you were actually was sent to 2,000 years ago on Earth to act as, like, go-between for, for the humans that were about to be taken? Yes. Wow. Yeah, we, I was sent back to make the negotiation to set up the colony that they were going to be living on. It's just that you would think that they would stay away from Romans, right? Because they have that long uh, history of being the arch nemesis of each other. Well, I mean, they're those people aren't on Earth anymore. They're at the mercy of the Germans, pretty much. So, I mean... It, it would be pretty easy to change their mindset, I sure. think. Yeah, as long as they meet the blood requirements, they, they probably weren't that fussy. Yeah. So, did all from your Thor Warden generation get fractured in a more humane way and then get age uh, advanced, or was it different for the others? I'm not going to say uh, that no one of my generation. I've met people my age who were in the programs who were mind fractured in the old fashioned way. I'm not sure which factions they were in. 
but most of the Solar Warden clones I met were people who had been age advanced and who had like artificial personalities. And do you have any uh, theory as to why 30 was chosen and not sooner, like the Germans? I, I think they prefer 25, at least for women. And do they age regress you once you get older, or do they just replace the clone? Uh, they keep age regressing you. I think that they pick whatever age you peak at. Because, like, they can scan your DNA and tell, like, how you're going to age and everything. So they pick whatever age is going to be your peak and then they keep you at that age but i'm guessing it's pretty costly and they reserve it only for their most prized assets am i right the age advancing the, yeah they're regressing no it's no age regression is dirt cheap if you have the really? right technology yeah so we can have it on earth and just uh, everyone live basically thousands of years yeah we could easily. So it's not it's not like it requires a lot of input. No, it doesn't. Oh. You you just need to train enough people for how to work the machine. That's it. Yeah, interesting. Wow. And what was the characteristic, the traits of this artificial personality that they implanted? Well, I think he was meant to have screen memories that didn't take partly, but it's hard for me to tell what was originally a part of what was downloaded and what was his development. But basically, Adam, he is, like I mentioned, he is a very angry, like you can't hardly imagine how much of an angry person he is. And he's manipulative. And um, it, he's also an alcoholic. I'm sure that was not programmed in. Because, uh, like, it, that's a disadvantage for a military person. But he was made to basically be, like, obedient and follow orders. And however else his personality turned out, they didn't really care. And was he aware there was... Uh fake uh, or, or was that your own conclusion that was my conclusion he was not aware he he was given a cover story when he woke up uh that he didn't know who he was or where he was or anything they gave him a cover story that there had been an explosion and that his wife and kids were dead but they they just managed to salvage his brain and grow him a new body. Um, much like if you've ever seen Ghost in the Alita. Shell. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was very similar to that. And so he went through an identity crisis, which leaked over to me for quite a while, uh, where he was majorly depressed. He was... He became an alcoholic. He was... For a while, he was something of a sex addict. Like, yeah. And do they all receive such a cover story? And uh, the, the artificial personality, is it specific to the individual? Or do they have certain templates? Or, or is that too deep of a cut? I think they go pretty fairly individual, uh, usually. I mean, the thing that they ha all have in common is that they're all given basically like obedience and a programmed amount of anger against whoever the enemy is. But other than that, people are pretty much individuals. So. And while you were there, at least in the beginning, did you feel you were there willingly or did you feel like they were oppressing you in general? I felt like I wanted to be there, but I also didn't think I would be allowed to leave if I asked. Um, I was just, like, literally, he just woke up one day, a 30-year-old man with no memories or knowledge of anything, and they just kind of gave him this job, and 
like he didn't really have any other options. So was he a prisoner? It's a gray area is what I would say. Yeah, because where else was he going to go at that point? Yeah. Yeah, they set it up cleverly. But do you know why you were assigned the outpost of Europa, which is, which we should also mention, it's a moon of Jupiter? No, just, I think it, I think the explanation given was just like short staffing at that time, which it very much was. So, uh, what about, go ahead. Uh, if you can give just a quick uh, rundown of Europa, like its physical characteristics. Oh, yes. Okay. On the surface, it's basically just ice with some red rock under it. And it's there's white. all white. Probably, yeah. And there, well, there are actually red streaks that are showing up in some of the new pictures. Um, but there was one of the Star Wars movies, they showed a planet that had um, an ice coating, but if you scratched it, there was red rock under that's similar to Europa. In my article on it, I described it as mountains. That wasn't quite correct. I should have said plateaus. These, like, huge plateaus just of solid ice. And there is, like, miles and miles down, there is an ocean. There is, like, uh, volcanic activity at the core, so that warms it up enough for there to be a deep underground ocean uh, that goes on. It's miles deep, this ocean is. And um, it does have life in it. The only sentient life I saw that's native to Europa are these... Um, they're eels that are like 100 feet long. And they're... Bio yeah. Well, lighter gravity. So everything is bigger. And they're oh. bioluminescent. And they're very telepathic. They're very spiritually advanced. And their technology is about Stone Age level. Uh, there are also, like, plankton that are the size of prawns. And there are prawns that are the size of, like, a 10-pound lobster. Like, they're huge sea creatures. Um... Were you shown these things uh, like in an archive or did you get to see for yourself and interact with the eels? Uh, I got to see them for myself. Part of the base had like, um, I guess it was sort of a reverse aquarium. Like there was a tunnel going underwater you could walk through and look out at the ocean. And right. we had, unfortunately, a couple of these eels were prisoners. I'm not sure what they'd done to deserve that, but they were. And so I did interact with them a few times. And that's when you found out that they don't take kindly to humans, especially Solar Warden. Yeah. They see us as invading them, which they're not wrong, by the way. Like, they didn't ask us to be there. We didn't ask them if it was okay to encroach on their territory. We just showed up but are they encroaching because they, they're aquatic and we're terrestrial i mean we do build underwater bases and stuff there i know there was a corporate base that was underwater so that wasn't solar warden but that one was definitely encroaching on their territory i would say and it's also worth mentioning that Europa is actually smaller than the moon, if I, if I remember right. So, Yeah, um, there's not that much space. Exactly. And have you ever been on the surface of it? I mean, I wanted to know if you ever saw the sky and what, what did Jupiter look like and the rest from it? The sky was absolutely breathtaking. There is... There's a tiny shred of an atmosphere. There's a few, like, water vapor clouds. But there's not enough to, like, color the sky or anything. Jupiter was, like, right there. And you could see, like, the clouds of Jupiter. And it was 
and the stars are bright, really bright, almost like miniature suns. Like it, it was incredibly beautiful on the surface. And just how much of the sky did Jupiter take up? Because I'm assuming that from the moon, um, the Earth looks about five times bigger than the moon, which is pretty sizable. So I was wondering. Yeah, well, and also Europa is pretty close in orbit to Jupiter. So if you're looking at it just, if you're on the face of Europa that's just facing Jupiter, Jupiter is pretty much all you're going to see. Whoa. Um, this, the base, the solar warden base, uh, at least the surface portion of it was just about at the North Pole. So you could see most of the upper half of Jupiter. And if you looked up and around, you would see other stuff. Right. So do you recall how you actually uh, traveled to Europa in the first place? <sighs> yes, um, by portal. I woke up in a cloning facility on Ganymede. I, I believe it was Ganymede at this point. And after a couple of days of like adjusting to the clone body and stuff, and there was also something they were doing where they were skimming my blood. I'm still not sure what that was all about, but they were doing some dialysis thing that when the blood went back into my body, it was translucent and pink. They'd skimmed so much from it. Like, so I was really, really sick for a couple of days. And then I spent a couple of days, like, relearning how to walk which was pretty quick and all that and then i was escorted to europa by a portal and we came out we walked straight through it we came out at the far end of this base which was one pretty much one very long road we came out at the far end and walked to the area where my apartment was and I'd already been assigned an apartment and all that. But yeah, that's how I got there. Right, right. And just quickly, was the portal artificial or was it by nature left there? It was artificial. And what did it feel like and where things stood out about it? It's a very strange feeling stepping through a portal. It feels like, for the split second when you're walking through it, it feels like you're being separated from your body. I believe the way it works is it actually does dematerialize you and then rematerialize you on the other side. Um, you might uh, say that you are entering like a higher density and then you're being pushed back into physical, I guess. Yeah, you could look at it that way, yeah. Um, and the portal itself, it had kind of a blue, like, it looked similar to water, kind of. You could see through it. You could see what was on the other side, but there was like a blue watery mist. And that was slightly warm. It didn't feel like much. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it was instantaneous and the distance is... I don't know how many millions of kilometers. And just out of curiosity, have you been through portals that have gone even further than that? And were they equally instantaneous? Yes, I have, and they were. Um, this technology, um, I believe this is a tall white technology, and it's a dumbed-down version of how they get around on their ships. Uh, we have ones that are... Like, Solar Warden portals are made for people to walk through. The Tall Whites have ones that uh, are big enough to fly ships through. Uh, but they did not let us have access to that. Yeah, they're, they're expensive to run, I heard. Mm-hmm, very. And, and what, was, what was your initial impression when you, when you got to the base on Europa uh, where you were posted? It didn't really seem all that special, honestly. Um, which sounds crazy now, being on Earth. Uh, but 
I guess the artificial personality they had downloaded was used to space stuff, so it was built into a cavern very far underground, um, very far, that it was sort of like a hot spring type of thing, so it was naturally warm uh, enough. They just, they did have to introduce, like, breathable air, but that's pretty easy, so. Yeah, as long as you have a confined area, but it wasn't smooth as the, the outer surface, I mean, it was formed naturally. Uh, yes. Of the cavern, you mean? Yes. Yes. And what was the style of architecture? Did it look uh, high-tech? And uh, I think you made the comparison with a certain video game, which I will also post here, that it looked almost cyberpunk. Yeah, the, the buildings themselves weren't very special. They were just like blocky, concrete kind of buildings. But there were like cyberpunk-esque things, uh, like lots of neon lights, lots of, uh, like, there were some robots out cleaning the street. Uh, but that's that's in contrast to the German colonies, which are much more traditional and pretty much... Yes. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, some how, of them... How do you explain that? Just different styles. Um, it's... The Germans want to look traditional. If they wanted to look insanely high tech, they very easily could. Uh, so you, it sounds like you you kind of prefer the German style. Yeah, I kind of do. I'm a old fashioned guy when it comes to architecture. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. And just how heavy was this the their use of uh, gadgets and uh, artificial intelligence and like. Solar Warden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they actually were pretty low-tech in a lot of ways. Like I said, they had robots cleaning the streets and some stuff like that, but they actually are still using typewriters for their records because they're so paranoid about getting hacked that they keep their records on paper. So to this day, their offices will still have like a typing pool of secretaries. And at the end of the day, you get one of the secretaries to come and type up a report for you for the day. So you know for a fact that that's the reason why uh, they, they don't use electronics because and was it due to like an incident where they did get hacked? Like I'm guessing it wasn't just the Gary McKinnon because that happened in 2001. Uh, yeah, no, this was way before McKinnon. And uh, I'm assuming that they'd been hacked or something at some point. Sure. And that's why they started doing that. And this settlement on Europa, was it mainly a military? And were they strict? Like, uh, if you went out of line, would you get punished if you were a dissident? Oh, yeah, you would. You would, you would get brig time. And oftentimes you'd probably be demoted. And sometimes you would be imprisoned, depending on how serious it was. Um, but you weren't? No, I wasn't. Uh, I did get yelled at a few times. But <laughs> it was mostly military. There was a civilian contingent. Most of the ETs living there were uh, civilians. They were the people who were running, like, the restaurants and the hotels and whatnot so they were civilian and there were some civilians who were humans who had had genetic work done uh some of them were like human animal chimeras that you hear people talk about and a few of them were there was this one family and I don't know what their deal was, but they had gotten genetic work done to be bioluminescent. Um, yeah, that's possible. And uh, Am I to understand that these bioluminescent humans uh, had their modification during their lifetime, not just before? Yeah, during. Um, well, 
I mean, they had children, and genetic modification does carry on to the next generation. So I imagine the kids probably were born with it, but the adults, yeah, they'd had it done artificially by someone. And were you able to choose? like uh, whether you wanted to have such a modification or were they enforced? And what was actually their, their reason? Because it sounds, sounds a little superfluous. Yeah, it does. I suspect maybe that family was from a colony that was like at the bottom of an ocean or on a rogue planet or something where there was just no natural light. I don't think they were from Europa. And they do do that sometimes where if it's too much work to adapt the planet to people, they'll adapt people to live on the planet. Like, that's a whole side thing. But I think that was the case, and that they just wound up living on Europa somehow. And the human-animal chimeras, were they able to, like, integrate and have a social life? And were they able to, like, communicate with humans, or were they dumbed down? They could communicate. I believe most of them were slaves who had... <clears throat> I know people who were around in this era who have talked about how they made, like, a shit ton of these chimeras, and I think maybe they made too many of them, and so some of them just wound up being enslaved on within bases and whatnot. But they could communicate. They were as intelligent, if not more so, than a typical person. Oh. And were they efficient at what they were doing? Yeah. Which was what? Uh, just odd jobs, mechanic stuff, housekeeping stuff. Um, we had one girl who was... I think she might have been like a human and crocodile chimera. She somewhat resembled a Draco, but she was our file clerk. So just odd jobs is pretty much what they were doing. They, I never saw any of them in a position of power at all. And can you name maybe a couple of other animals that you've seen crossed? Maybe some uh, of the weirdest. One that looked like either a gopher or a beaver cross over. Um... There were some who were, I don't know what they were. I think they'd been crossed with some kind of a fish because they had scales in, and they looked like fish scales, not like reptile scales. Um, there was a fish human in series at, in Tony's account, so that tracks. Mm. And was the food there grown in a hydroponic garden? Was it replicator-based? Or was it imported, or was it all of the above? Well, all of the above. We had we had some hydroponic gardens, not many. The Americans weren't very good with that early on. Uh, it took them several decades to get good with that technology. Um, so most of it was from replicators or imported. Imported stuff was very expensive. Though, yes. but there was a, there was like a store, kind of a luxury import store, uh, where you could order things from Earth or from other planets. Did you ever partake in that? Yeah, I did. So you did have, you did make some income then. Yes. You said it was at a premium. Yes, we. I believe we had a credit system for. Behave, good behavior and productivity. Right, right. Uh, I believe the civilians used the American dollar, the same one that we use on Earth. And how how do the colonists there perceive Earth, and what's what's their level of disinformation and like compartmentalization? They they have a perception of Earth as being like a really backwards place that they left for a better life, kind of, which they're not really wrong. Uh, but at the same time, they're oftentimes they do end up being in way worse lives there than they would have here. But 
As far as I'm aware, Solar Warden colonists are not told that Earth was destroyed. At least the ones I met. I'm not going to put words into anyone's mouth and say, if they believe otherwise or if they interacted with people who said otherwise, I'm not going to say that they're wrong. But in my... It seems a little too big of a coincidence for both the Americans and the Germans to use the same tactic. Yeah, it and does. So in general, it seems like there's less disinformation than in the German faction. About Earth, yes. There's a shit ton of disinformation about the Germans within the American faction. Like, there's... The Americans think that the Holocaust is still happening. Uh, they... They think that the Nazis in space are a one-to-one -one parallel to the Nazis on Earth, which they're not. They're not good people by any stretch of the imagination, but they have changed in a few ways. What's the main way that they changed? I'm curious. Their racial stuff. Uh, when they joined with the Draco, I talked about this in my last show, the Draco don't really give a fuck about your skin color or whatever, because they have the technology to overcome any genetic anything. So the Germans also stopped caring at that same time period. And did you know that you were going to return to Earth one day after you were done with your duty? And was it something that you were looking forward to? I had no idea what my future held. I was just doing my job and what I was told and trying to make as good a life for myself within that situation as I could. And I've remembered being sent back. I was not told diddly squat. I think I sat in a chair and some guy just woke behind me and shot me in the head. Like that was just how it ended. Like, no warning, no ceremony, nothing. So, yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty drastic, but in a way, at least, they, they don't give you false hope or anything. I don't know. Uh, but did you, can you recount your one-room apartment that you lived in for 50 years? Yes, I can. Um, it was, there was a lot of noise. It was above a nightclub. Um and it was on, I believe, the fourth story of a five-story concrete block um, that it had a futon-type bed that folded out of the couch. Not, not like a Japanese futon on the floor. It was like an American futon that folded out of the couch. And um, I did have a TV... The original TV I had actually had, like, rabbit ears. Eventually, I did get a flat screen. Um, there was a toilet. Well, there was a little closet bathroom. Um, the shower was, I believe it was water-operated. Uh, because they have plentiful water. Yeah. There's basically, it's basically impossible to run out of water on Europa. So, the... Not like on Mars. Yeah, it wasn't an issue. And, um, oh, the toilet was, if you sat on the toilet, your knees were under the sink. Um, I see. I, I don't know how graphic you want to get. You can cut this out. But, like, it, it, when I pissed, I would stand next to the toilet because I couldn't stand in front of it. <laughs> right, right. Maybe do it in the sink, then. <laughs> yeah, maybe that too. But so it was really cramped, and uh, oh, and also, did you have trouble going to sleep with the noise? For a while, yes. Uh, eventually, I just adapted to it. Uh, oh, and there was also I forgot to mention there was a little kitchenette. I had a small food printer, um, a replicator that looked like a small microwave. It wasn't a very good one, so I would avoid using it. And I did have a little stove and oven and a tiny little refrigerator. But no microwave, right? They knew that it was uh, injurious. 
Yeah. Right. And so what uh, did they show on TV? I'm wondering, because you would expect them to give you more than that. I would I would like uh, expect that uh, a glass pad at least, but I, I they probably did that on purpose to not distract you too much. I had a glass pad and I could do some stuff on there. Um, there on the TV, um, there was a lot of news stuff of what was happening on various planets. I remember a home renovation show, actually, that we could sometimes watch. Depending on where Europa was in its orbit, if it was aligned with Mars, we would watch this home renovation show that it was just like the ones we have on Earth, except it was on Mars. <laughs> so so Mars is responsible for, is the source of all these stations, because I'm guessing they don't originate in that 5,000 strong colony. No, they don't. Well, I mean, it does come from other colonies, too. There was some entertainment that came from Ganymede. Um, there was the, some that came from one of the moons of Saturn. I'm not sure which one. Oh, and there was some which came from a... There's a massive space station around Neptune. Like a a couple of hundred miles across space station floating in the atmosphere of Neptune. I'm uh, guessing the sun is really dim by then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's not a problem, really. Uh, except people are pale, but, like, that's not really a problem. Yeah, people born there are pale. But that's not a big deal. And there's a lot of entertainment that comes out of that place. Cool. And were you able to actually socialize when you were off duty and even make some friends, maybe? Yeah, I could. Um, I was friends with my landlord, who was a red ant being. I don't know what their planet of origin is, but I've encountered them several times in different altars. And they were, um, but they're some of the sweetest aliens I've ever met, actually. They were always very kind, uh, helpful, understanding. So I was friends with my landlord. Um, I became friends with uh, a few of the prostitutes who I would I would partake in their services. But there were some of them that, like I was, I genuinely was friends with. I didn't become friends with hardly any of my coworkers because most of them were just as assholish as me.